I want to begin the evening with a presentation. This is a grand occasion for IPFW. We are in the middle of a 25th anniversary celebration, and we have as the highlight, or certainly one of the highlights of that celebration, a distinguished lecturer, Professor Starr. I'd like to present you with this plaque. We will remember this evening for a long time, and we hope you will remember it fondly as well. In a year when IPFW is celebrating its 25-year odyssey, no speaker and no subject could be more appropriate than the ones we have tonight. Our subject is the deeply mysterious time and environment that produced the Odyssey, the Iliad, and Western civilization. How did the Greeks, not very numerous or wealthy, often harried by their neighbors and nearly always at odds with each other, how did they find it in themselves to spin the cultural threads that stretch unbroken to our own time? Our guide is the most distinguished of American classical historians, Chester G. Starr. Professor Starr is a native Missourian, earned undergraduate and master's degree from the University of Missouri, and did his doctoral work at Cornell. After a postdoctoral period at the American Academy in Rome, he joined the faculty of the University of Illinois. His academic career was almost immediately interrupted by military service, by the end of which he had become chief historian of the U.S. Fifth Army and, as a part of his responsibility, uh, supervised the writing of the history of the American role in the Italian campaign. Returning to Illinois, he progressed to full professor with brief detours to chair the Division of Humanities and the History Department. In 1970, he moved to the University of Michigan, where he became Bentley Professor in 1973, a status he now holds emeritus. Professor Starr was the founding president of the Association of Ancient Historians. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has twice held Guggenheim Fellowships. He has been awarded several honorary degrees and numerous distinguished lectureships. Professor Starr's first book, The Roman Imperial Navy, was published in 1941. Last year, he published The Influence of Sea Power on Ancient History, and so he has returned to maritime history after an interval of 50 years. In between, he has written several highly successful summarizing works, including The Ancient Greeks, The Ancient Romans, and most conspicuously, the three editions of his splendid History of the Ancient World. He has also produced a number of more narrowly focused monographs, including two closely related to his topic tonight, The Economic and Social Growth of Early Greece, and Individual and Community, The Rise of the Polis, both of which are available in our library. Professor Starr, welcome to IPFW. I, for one, have been looking forward to this evening for a long time. fairly lengthy academic career, I have known a variety of deans, but however varied they may have been, they almost all shared one quality, very cautious statements. <laughs> I think Dean Cox is to be commended for being bold and presenting me with this plaque before the lecture <laughs> rather than afterwards. Thank you. A friend of mine from grade school onward who has long lived in Indiana has warned me that my first duty is to pay my respects to Mad Anthony Wayne. But with your permission, I shall leave his Indian wars to American specialists. Instead, let me invite you to travel farther afield to Arizona and there inspect a very different group of Indians 
the Hohokam tribe. The reason for this apparently bizarre diversion will, I trust, shortly become apparent. During their heyday down into the 14th century after Christ, the Hohokam Indians constructed remarkable ceremonial and living centers out of adobe, impressive remains of which can still be seen northeast of Tucson. Their advanced economic and social structure was supported by the most extensive system of irrigation canals yet developed in North America. And then, in the 14th century, their society disintegrated into the feeble remains of Papago and other local tribes. The reasons for the decline are utterly obscure. I myself am inclined to think that when two Hohokams met, they had to greet each other with repeated ho hos and their way of life dissolved in gales of laughter. <laughs> the interesting point is that their progress proceeded so far and no further. At their height, they surpassed the natives of the Aegean in the Dark Ages before 700 BC. The Greeks then lived in a simple, largely agricultural fashion with scarcely any evidence of the potential which led to the rise of Hellenic culture after 700 BC. Until recently, indeed, one could confidently assert that in the Dark Ages, Greece produced absolutely no structure of any pretensions to equal those of the Hohokam Indians. But it is dangerous to be so categorical. Some years ago, English archaeologists uncovered on the island of Euboea, off the Greek coast, a 10th century building erected as a shrine for a local chieftain in which his chariot was buried. Still, the Dark Ages were not only dark, but also devoid of any testimony to artistic, political, or other capabilities. Then matters changed with great speed. History is often compared to a river, but rivers do not always flow placidly in broad curves, especially in their headwaters. So in the 8th century BC, Every aspect of Greek life began the magnificent alterations which led straight on to the impressive classical age of Phidias, Socrates, Aeschylus, and a host of other artists and thinkers who have influenced Western civilization ever since. In the broadest outlines, one may trace the political, aesthetic, philosophical, and many other views, all Greek words incidentally, which animate this university and modern America as a whole back to sources in modern Western Europe, and thence through earlier centuries across the Middle Ages to Rome, and from Rome to Greece, but no further. Here first arose and were elaborated political and ethical values which we take for granted. The emphasis on logical approaches to problems in our more rational moments. The aesthetic principles by which we have judged artistic creativity at least until recent years. <laughs> Western civilization first began to be visible in the Aegean world in the 8th century BC. How do we know that the fundamental values and beliefs of the Hellenic outlook were coming into focus at this point? Valuable testimony is provided by the final consolidation of the Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey after centuries of oral recitation and embellishment. To this end, the appearance of the Greek alphabet at the same time was of great value 
in permitting men to write down definitive texts of the epics. The Greeks were not averse to borrowing from their East, as I shall note more fully later, and the source for the alphabet lies in Semitic lands. But the Greeks made the loan a far more supple, easily learned script by adding vowels, including some which the Etruscans and Romans later stripped off and so made spelling problems more difficult ever since. <laughs> it should be emphasized that the new alphabet was not developed for business purposes. Greek contracts remained essentially oral, but it was marvelously adapted to the preservation of epic poetry in the hexameter meter and thereafter the far more complicated meters of Sappho and other great poets. The rival heroes in the Iliad taunt each other before their duels in childish fashion like boys sparring on a play field. But the poem has a far deeper significance than simply a dispassionate tale of war and death. Its poet announces in the first line that his is a tale of anger, the wrath of Achilles at being deprived of Briseis, his booty in a raid. But the essential thrust of the epic is to prove that anger does not pay. Achilles' friend Patroclus dons his armor and is killed by Trojan Hector. After Achilles avenges Patroclus and desecrates the body of Hector, he must, in the end, yield the corpse to the entreaties of the Trojan king and father Priam for its proper burial. Anger brings retribution from the gods. Due moderation is better in all things. A lasting ethical belief which echoed down the centuries of Greek civilization until it was explored in the great Athenian tragedies. The Odyssey is generally and rightly considered a lesser work than the Iliad, both in its poetic character and in the vagaries of the plot, which shifts among the trials of Odysseus, the search of Telemachus for his father, and the patience of Penelope weaving and reweaving her tapestry on the island of Ithaca. Yet it too, like some minor epics long lost, comes out of the same background and reaches at time a high point of excitement. Women appear only incidentally in the Iliad. They have so much larger a role in the Odyssey that an English scholar seriously suggested that it was written by a woman. Modern Homeric scholarship is one of the most astounding creations of the human mind. <laughs> the epics, <clears throat> great as they are, do not stand alone as evidence that the evolution of Greek civilization was well underway before 700 BC. Greek mythology, for example, was certainly inherited from earlier times, but now began to be visible in Homeric references and the first artistic illustrations. Many peoples of the world have created stories about gods and heroes and their tales, whether coming from India, Greece, or Scandinavia, often have the same basic plot or theme. The most influential mythology of Western civilization, however, has been that created by the Greeks. This stands out above all others for its rich yet disciplined imagination, for its humane quality, which rarely emphasized the cruel or frightening aspects of life as against celebrating the powers of mankind, and for its aesthetic nature. Greek myths have been a fertile source of ideas for dramatists, artists, and psychologists both in high school and in college. Greek mythology is the most popular classical subject, even if thereafter we have to live with the knowledge that we may suffer from an Oedipus complex. 
One final line of evidence for the outburst which began in the 8th century is provided by a variety of physical testimony, all the more important because there can be no question that it is contemporary. Unlike many of my colleagues, I firmly prefer such tangible material to the gossamer creations which some fashion out of legends dubiously handed down in later texts. Thus, Athenian potters living by the later Dipylon Gate were forming by 750 great vases almost man high and decorated in the current geometric style which had a very limited repertoire of motives. My wife, a kindly critic, pointed out that you might possibly not know a Dipylon pot very well and so, at great expense, you have on the back of the blue sheet on your program a magnificent photograph of a Dippelin pot. Well, you can tell what it looks like at any rate. Um, if you were to go with me to Athens and visit the National Museum and could resist going in the Mycenaean room straight ahead with all its glitter of gold, but turn to the left and go into the rooms illuminating the growth of Greek civilization. In the very first room, you would see this pot in pride of place, the Dipylon Amphora, which stands almost man high. It's a magnificent work, just as a piece of pottery. Uh, there are two Dipylon pots in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. They are the only other complete pots of this kind in existence. Museums in Brussels, Paris, and so on have to make do with fragments of Dipylon pots. But to return, just as Homer, who had at his disposal only 16 possible variants of the hexameter line spun out of this matrix of varied poetic tissue, so too, Dipylon potters could build masterpieces which exhibit, as I have noted elsewhere, a synthesis of clearly defined parts which has a dynamic quality. The uh, top, the body of the vase, and then the uh, base proper. Uh, a deliberate simplification of form and decoration into a structure capable of infinite variation, an emphasis on rational principles of harmony and proportion, as the Western world has understood these principles ever since, a sense of order in which the imagination is harnessed by the powers of the mind. Artists were also fashioning in wood, clay, ivory, and bronze figurines, still small but pregnant with possibilities for the emergence of large-scale sculpture in the next century. Temples likewise appeared, though so far only of wood on a stone foundation. Uh, structures made entirely of stone were erected only in the middle of the seventh century. The way was open, and with remarkable speed, great Greek poets, artists, and thinkers were to elaborate an ever more complex intellectual structure across the 7th and 6th centuries, an era commonly called the Archaic Period, into the developed triumphs of classical Greece between 500 and 300 BC. If you want a road map chronologically, uh, the reverse of the Dipylon pot has got a breakdown of the major chronological stages of Greek civilization. And then, under 5th century and 4th century, a brief listing of the amazing creations that the Greeks were capable of in 200 years. So far, my intent has been a cunning one to persuade those of you who may be skeptics, or perhaps not fully at home in Greek civilization, that it is indeed the fountainhead of Western culture not in the usual fashion of celebrating the glories of classical Hellas, but by illuminating the first major evidence that it was far to outstrip the whole Holcomb.
Indians. After all, I've lived almost four decades in the early Greek world and have found it ever challenging and amazing. My major purpose this evening, however, is rather different and can be summed up in the question, why did all this take place? Historians these days tend to duck such problems, which lead them into weighty philosophical issues involved in causation. They prefer instead to concentrate after the model of Brodel and his famous French school on factual analyses with as many statistics as can be assembled. In looking at the ancient world, we do not have to worry about statistics, which are sparse and not often reliable. As an unreconstructed practitioner of old-fashioned history, I judge a search for causes as useful as a description of events. The answers which have been given over the years to the problem I've just raised are sometimes amusing. Deeper and more valid lines of exploration, however, can be found especially in the religious and political structure and values of Greek life I shall also have occasion to consider the nature of economic organization and evolution in the ancient Aegean. First, a very brief glance at the trivial, though fascinating, modes of explanation. For example, the purported influence of Greek geography and climate on local development. Scholars thus have pointed out that land and sea are sharply distinguished on the islands and mainland coasts and have deduced that the tendency of Greek philosophers to couch their explanations in terms of opposites is a reflection of the physical environment. Obviously, this is far too simplistic. So too are celebrations of the clarity of the atmosphere as promoting the unfolding of the Hellenic miracle. It is true that a modern Westerner has often felt exhilarated on entering into Greece, at least until smog enveloped Athens, and has experienced, as a well-known geographer put it, a heightened Lebensgefühl and geistige Regsamkeit, sensitivity to life and intellectual keenness, more judicious exploration of the effects of the landscape on modern Greeks can be found in a brilliant work by Ob Husbert Lancaster, Classical Landscape with Figures, which is in the bibliography on your sheet. Equally illuminating on the character of contemporary Greeks is Henry Miller's Colossus of Marusi. But Miller spent most of his brief stay in Greece in an Athenian taverna hidden away from the brilliant sun and bracing air, we can, I think, discount the effects of climate. Far more influential and pervasive since the early 19th century has been an emphasis on the remarkable qualities of Greek blood. A sober English scholar has thus recently attributed the success of Athenian government to, quote, an almost unique genius for democratic politics. More generally, if Greeks were great as artists and thinkers, it was because they had inherited their abilities. A rather well-known 20th century figure liked to talk about this at dinner, and even felt that his fellow Germans were direct heirs both of Athens and of Sparta, Adolf Hitler. But even reputable historians have given allegiance to the belief that Greek blood could work miracles. It still appears, for instance, in the new edition of the Cambridge Ancient History, a standard survey of current knowledge. Yet this, too, is nonsense. We do need blood to stay alive, but we all know, or should know, that our corpuscles transmit no cultural values or abilities <laughs> in themselves. So we must look farther afield. Historians commonly are fond of ferreting out conditioning antecedents which can explain the events they are studying. When I was a graduate student at Cornell, Carl Becker gave a famous course on the French Revolution, but in a whole year, 
rarely got down to the revolution itself. Thus, it is not surprising that there is a common assumption that the advanced civilizations of the Near East centered in Mesopotamia and Egypt provided the ideas and models which could inspire Greek imitation. By the 8th century, it is true, materials such as ivory and artistic motives like the row of grazing deer on the Dippelin base made their way from the Levant to Greece. So too did ideas, such as the alphabet, and at least one mythical tale involving the castration of Uranus, a barbarous exception to the generally serene character of Greek mythology. But the assertion, which has been made, that the Homeric epics reflect the Mesopotamian tale of Gilgamesh passes all belief. In fact, the Aegean world was, fortunately, almost completely sundered from the Near East culturally, economically, and politically down nearly to 700, and so the epic bards and their fellow artists were free to develop along their own lines. If the first efforts of Greek sculptors owe something to Egyptian prototypes, though this can be debated, the famous bronze charioteer of Delphi and the Parthenon frieze were far different from anything produced in the land of the Nile. The Greeks fashioned an essentially new outlook on life, which they spread widely through colonization over almost every shore of the Mediterranean. And it was this model which was to have decisive effects in Rome and many other areas. Don't we must look carefully inside the Greek world itself, religiously, politically, socially, and economically. Religion must, as Aristotle once observed, have pride of place, for Greek life was infused on all levels from the family to the state by religious observances and beliefs. Yet religion was more an impetus to Greek arts, letters, and thoughts than an impediment, a beneficent influence in all aspects of life. There was no orthodoxy by which to judge sex, no creed necessary for salvation, no sacred book. Homer can be called the Bible of the Greeks only in the sense that the Iliad was everywhere the base of their education. No dogma on creation which was impious to question. The Greeks basically were free of taboos, not wedded to superstition, or otherwise hampered in their intellectual curiosity, as many societies have been. So, eventually, they built majestic temples to celebrate civic pride and to house the statues of the public patron deities. And those statues often came to be works of art in themselves. To account for the origins of the world and the vicissitudes of mankind, the Greeks first told mythical tales in which the gods spoke large. But their thinkers eventually shook off this inheritance and turned to develop purely secular, rational explanations in philosophy, physics, and mathematics. The Mesopotamians knew in practice that the square on the hypotenuse, of the hypotenuse in a right angle triangle was equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. But it was Greeks who advanced a formal proof which led on to Euclid's geometry. The most famous textbook ever written one which I imagine everybody in this room has had to suffer with a little bit at least, and one which well illustrates the major qualities of Greek civilization. Emphasis on the general, rather than the specific, harmony and proportion, and ruthless logical analysis. 
By 700, another very important change had taken root across the Greek world at home and abroad, the consolidation of the form of political organization called the polis. This term is often badly mistranslated as city, state, for the Greeks did not yet have true cities at this point, and some states, such as Sparta, never developed a real urban center. We must sometimes stick to Greek terms to avoid introducing misconceptions. Physically, the polis was a small piece of territory, often, but not always marked off by mountains and seas. An island might form a single polis, but off the coast of Attica, the island of Chaos, only six by 10 miles, six by 10, was always divided into four states, three of which eventually issued some coinage. Geographically, the important point was the fact that all major activity was conducted at one specific location by free citizens who had to be present to take part. There was no representative government in ancient Greece. Activity in this one-celled society was marked by regular rules of procedures and a simple system to establish and administer these rules. Above all, the polis was protected by one of the deities of the Greek pantheon, and its inhabitants felt themselves supported, encouraged, but not totally subservient to this spiritual and religious unity. We think of Greek states in terms of Athens, Sparta, Corinth, and so on. But Hellenes themselves always envisaged their communities not in any abstract sense or just as physical territories. They were unions of citizens such as the Athenians in whose name treaties were made and laws issued. The Greeks had in some created a system of government in which there could be citizens and those citizens could have a voice in shaping policy, especially, but not exclusively, at Athens. Aristotle is firm that a polis aims at being, as far as it can be, a society composed of equals and peers, which has arisen, quote, for the sake of the general advantage which it brings very similar in tone, and perhaps not accidentally so, is the statement of purposes at the beginning of the Constitution of the United States. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and posterity, the polis, as I have sometimes put it, had about it an invisible wall which both protected and also confined its inhabitants. Here I might uh, divigate to note that some years ago Jackson Community College invited me to give a talk one evening at Jackson Penitentiary on the Greeks in general terms. No, oh, I did. I'll always give a lecture. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> But the audience, I've never had an audience like that audience. The next week, as it so happened, I went off to Harvard to give a lecture, and the audience was polite, but it left as soon as it could. But the audience at Jackson Penitentiary didn't want to leave. They enjoyed it. They stayed. They asked questions. They were, but it kept me all night, I think. Uh, Finally, the moderator managed to get them to agree maybe they should go elsewhere. But before they left, one of them came up to me and said, well, now, Professor, you don't really need to talk about walls around the community. We know all about walls here. <laughs> Two aspects of the polis world demand further emphasis. In the first place, there were hundreds of states, perhaps about 1,500 
if one counts the far-flung colonies, each of which was politically independent of its homeland. The typical polis ranged between 50 and 100 square kilometers, and its population can be estimated at 620 to 1250. Athens, which eventually had some 200,000 men, women, children, and slaves, was very exceptional. Yet each state, whatever its size, had its own special qualities and local pride. There was true one Greek language, but it was spoken in many dialects. So too is another example of diversity. Potters everywhere tended to follow a common style but modern experts have no difficulty in deciding that this face was made at Corinth or that one was made at Athens. Any advance in one area, in other words, could be swiftly transmitted to others to be elaborated in further progress. This was, without doubt, one of the most important factors in the evolution of Greek civilization. A fascinating parallel can be found in the American university world, one element of which we are commemorating this fall. There are hundreds of universities in the United States, all stamped in very much the same fashion with colleges and departments for various disciplines, but each institution has its own particular character. What happens at Indiana, Purdue universities, and Fort Wayne thus can be easily picked up by other schools and there may have an unexpectedly wide influence. Secondly, there is a dark side to Greek political history which once led a professor of French to write a you know, violent attack on the eulogies of Hellenic culture. Not that I have found French history, all that noble. <laughs> internal dissensions, that is to say, and external conflicts could produce inhumane, brutal results almost beyond conception. Thucydides grimly describes the mutual murder of conservatives and radicals on the island of Corsaira, the modern Corfu, early in the Peloponnesian War and observes that this was only the beginning of such disasters. Later, in the fourth century, we hear of a mob at a state called Argos, which bludgeoned to death over a thousand, the upper classes. Plato <coughs> scarcely exaggerates also in asserting that, quote, every state is in a natural state of war with every other not indeed proclaimed by heralds, but everlasting. For bloody altercations were endemic in Greece among both major and minor states. If hostilities proceeded as far as a siege, the defeated side could be treated ruthlessly. Men were executed. They were pretty useless. And women and children sold into slavery. How else could one secure profit from one's victory? Considering that Athens was at war more often than not across the fifth century, it is amazing that its citizens could support the great cultural achievements of the age, for they bore the brunt of battle by land if they were rich enough to afford the armor of the infantrymen, the hoplite, or by sea, if a member of the lower classes tugging an oar in a galley. Yet warfare must be accounted a mirror image of that basic devotion to the polis which gave its citizens that spiritual support necessary for the great strides of Greek civilization. One last ingredient in Greek history needs brief comment, though modern historians might be surprised that economic matters take so minor a place in my tale. Dedication to the study of ancient life, if I may offer a justification, often leads one to look at the motive forces in 
human development rather differently. Obviously, there was no Protestant ethic in antiquity, but indeed, one can scarcely find a bourgeoisie consciously intent upon profit. The Greeks did not disdain material success, but they did not, did not easily find it via industry and commerce, and certainly not in agriculture. Yet farming was the main activity for all ancient societies which was carried out across the annual round of seasons in ways which changed only slowly, if at all. The rapid economic alterations which we expect in modern times and to which we may attribute significant political and social consequences simply could not have occurred in the ancient Mediterranean. The peasants who upheld Near Eastern societies did provide a surplus from the irrigated lands of Mesopotamia and Egypt, which could be marshaled for the pomp and wealth of kings, priests, and potentates. On the rocky hillsides and small plains of Greek lands, economic life was necessarily much simpler and led to far smaller revenues. There were in almost all areas only small landlords. The largest estate known at Athens was in the range of 30 hectares. We're going to be pretty European these days, about 75 acres. These men could not afford the gold and silver vessels of Asiatic nobles, but only clay drinking cups and the like. Though these vases are so magnificently painted that they can fetch today over a million dollars in the antiquities market. Poverty, as an exiled Spartan king told the great Persian monarch Xerxes, has been our companion since childhood, not grinding penury, but rather the necessity for most men to labor with their own hands and their own backs. Only a few aristocrats could enjoy a life of physical leisure in Greece. But these were the men, unlike many modern aristocrats, who often devoted themselves to philosophical meditation and literary achievements, the fruits of which has stamped Western thought ever since. Perhaps we've gone far enough in our search. After all, miracles are not easily explained. Yet the religious, social, political, and economic qualities of Greek life do help to illuminate its progress from the legendary travels of the wily Odysseus on to the building of the Parthenon the most polished and expensive temple ever erected in the Hellenic world. Just as Odysseus could boldly face his trials and mishaps, so too later Greeks rose above the disasters of war and their own personal troubles. The great poet Pindar summed up their outlook in glowing lines. And Gary Blumenshine ought to be able to quote this from memory. He's heard it so often. A changeable creature such as man, a shadow in a dream. Yet when God-given splendor visits him, a bright radiance plays over him. And how sweet is life. A changeable creature such as man, a shadow in a dream. Yet, when God-given splendor visits him, a bright radiance plays over him, and how sweet is life. Always the Greeks were free to seek the truth and thought and art. When Oedipus fiercely proclaimed, and Oedipus the king, I must not hear of not discovering the whole truth, he expressed the consistent efforts of Greek thinkers to plunge to the heart of a problem, no matter what the cost. That search has been passed on to the modern world and certainly animates the faculty and students 
of these universities, the 25th year of which we celebrate this fall. Only thus could they contribute as fully as they have to the cultural life of northern Indiana and farther afield. Like the Athenian sage Solon, whose motto was, I grow old, always learning many things. We may hope that Indiana, Purdue, at Fort Wayne will continue to flourish, and those who come to their halls will learn many things. Thank you. <laughs>